The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sharon Dooley. I'm going to be the moderator for this session. Uh, we have an interesting topic today. It's Big Data 101 for SQL dummies, and that's certainly a category in which I fall with respect to big data. So I'm very much looking forward to Paresh's talk. Uh, there's still an upcoming business analytics day in San Diego on October 3rd. I don't know if there's still a discount or not, but um, if you're interested, sign up at pass.org. And don't forget the summit. It's coming on up very quickly. We're going to, it starts on Halloween. And I have, I've got my plane tickets, my hotel, everything all set. Um, if you register, if you haven't registered, you can save $150. If you use our code VC15, FPS6 and for every 20 people that use our code we will get a complimentary registration and we'll raffle it off closer to the event. It is definitely the place to be. It will, the only problem you'll have is that one session will be three or four things you'd like to hear and you can only be in one place at a time. Uh, we are one of many virtual groups, all of which have an online presence, and some of some of which focus on different languages: global Chinese, Portuguese. Some of which fo focus on various aspects of the technology. You can join as many as you want, and you'll get mailings. Uh, just go to your past profile and check off the ones that you're interested in. Uh, now that fall has started, SQL Saturdays are going like mad. Uh, if you've never been to a SQL Saturday, it's something you should check out. Uh, it's a free one-day training event, and it's conference quality presentations and they're all over the place okay there are also many local chapters these give you a chance for face-to-face -face networking they have a physical presence and um, Thank you, Moeed. Tells me I'm not sharing, showing my screen. It's because you guys have heard this all before. You don't need to hear, see it again. But anyway, uh, the local chapters give you a chance for face-to-face -face networking. They usually after work, and there's often refreshments. Uh, my chapter, local chapter, always has pizza. Um, not my favorite food, but it's everybody else's favorite food. So, uh, PASS is an all-volunteer organization. Uh, we, yes, there's paid staff in headquarters managing IT and all of that. But you can volunteer for various things. You can volunteer to be a host at the summit and help a new person find his or her way around. You can take on a leadership role in one of the virtual groups, etc. This is not this slide is not intended for the people who have actually managed to come to the meeting. But to all the people who sign up, who discover us on YouTube and sign up, all they get is the recordings. And if they come to pass 
and get a member, they can get the supplemental materials like the scripts the speakers usually give us and so forth. Now, Big Data 101 for SQL Dummies is being presented by Paresh Motawala. He has a rather awesome biography. Uh, I don't think he's going to sing today. I assume he's not going to cook as part of his presentation. And I don't know about the stand-up com comedian bit, okay? <laughs> Paresh has presented for us before, and he's managed multi-terabyte uh, OLTB databases, and he loves learning and talking about big data. And that's what we're going to hear from him about today. He also mentors DBAs in the um, Boston area, and teaches public speaking and works with children around the globe via Circles of Growth, an organization he's uh, very involved with. And I'm going to make Paresh the presenter, but we have one more slide in this, and he's going to have to explain the questions because he's going to have to explain what this is all about. And once he finishes dealing with this poll, then he can put up his slides and um, do his thing. Hi, everyone. Uh, can I see that slide now? Or? Can you see that slide now? No, we can't. Let me see if I... Wait a sec. They should be seeing my screen right now. So. No, they shouldn't. They should still be seeing my screen. Oh, because you invited me already to. Because I, I wanted you to talk to this slide I made. Oh, okay. So uh, let's see. But I've lost my. Yeah, let me make you the presenter again, right? That might be easier. You can take it back. I can take it back. Yeah. With extreme prejudice. I should be able to sh I, I should be able to show my screen anyway cuz I'm the organizer. Correct. As people can see um, me. That's your keyboard? No, that's your I don't know what that is. I don't have my webcam turned on, I don't think. Yay, now you have it. Now I have my this shown, and you can talk about it. You still have your mic and everything. I still can't see it, though. Just, ah, now I see. Okay. Makes sense. So here's a question for you folks. Um, can you see the screen um, big enough or no? You can actually expand this or let it take over the full screen, Sharon. Ah. Yeah, okay, this is much better, okay. Cool, so folks, as you can see that the area in red is where the Ebola outbreak is believed to have come out of in the past, about three, four years ago, and According to you, which is the closest place that should have gotten the Ebola outbreak immediately after this country? And in terms of big data, how would you define the closest neighbor for this country? You can add enter things in the questions pane if you've got ideas. Sure. So you can see that there is A which is like the immediate neighbor, B is the immediate neighbor, C is slightly far, but it also had limited outbreak. Uh, there's a lot of medically evacuated cases in Europe, uh, part of Kansas, a um, little bit of South Carolina, uh, or is that Georgia, I forget, uh, Texas, and 
some of the cases in uh, upper New York. So I just wanted to kind of have a little bit of your attention there and see what do you define as a good, uh, which is a neighbor that would have gotten this disease and why would you call it a neighbor? If you can just put down your answers there, that'll be awesome. So yeah, that I can one, somebody's written um, airline routes and road connections, not geomet ge geographic proximity. And the answer to question one, the closest neighbor is B. Correct. So uh, whoever the gentleman is, so the B is like literally the correct answer but even one if you of see them that, is, one of them is a gentleman and the other is a lady so just don't assume they're all gentlemen oh uh, yes i am so sorry <laughs> i am so sorry about that but yes so ladies and gentlemen thank you for uh, the response there i can't see who responded there because i have this in a full screen mode but uh, whoever responded that the airline route was actually the one that defined the closest neighbor so you can see the people from this country, the one in the red, most of them traveled directly to Texas or Kansas or somewhere in Europe. And that is how they were actually able to spread the disease. And this was done with the use of big data, not just hunch, okay? So thank you for those who took a second to answer that. And if I can now have the screen back to me, please. Yep. Hello everyone, how's everyone doing? Uh, this is uh, Paresh Motivala, I'm from Boston, uh, the land of uh, five times Super Bowl winning Patriots. We stay just about a couple of miles north of there. And uh, I've been doing this database administration work for a while. I've been speaking at over close to 100 or a little more than 100 SQL Saturdays and groups. Uh, last year or so I have been concentrating and studying more an increasing amount of big data uh, initiatives and um, courses through Microsoft Virtual Academy. Some of this is what I'm actually going to share with you today. Again, this is a 101 uh, talk, so please don't expect any serious or any Python scripts that is going against a multi-terabyte database, okay? So without much ado, let's start. And if this works, that'll be awesome. Okay, cool. So that's me, my wife. Uh, as uh, Sharon had said that I teach public speaking, these are some of my graduates. That's my daughter who is a doctor and my son who is a runner and a sophomore in UMass Lowell. This is my contact information for those who are interested. Um, I just got invited to use the New England SQL Server user group, and I've been running the Boston BI group for about nine months now. I also organize and speak at a lot of uh, SQL events here, including the Global Azure Boot Camp, Providence SQL Saturday, organized Boston SQL Saturday in prior life, um, and uh, Boston BI Saturdays as well. <clears throat> so who should attend? Uh, just so you get an idea. The DBAs especially, a um, lot of what we are doing is slowly going to get into big data schemes. Uh, so if you think that whatever you are doing with SQL Server today is going to get you through the next five years, really think twice. CIOs, um, they usually love to attend anything that says big data, even if they don't understand much. Uh, marketing peeps, uh, definitely you want to use this for your benefit. A lot of marketing efforts save millions and millions of dollars by using appropriate big data. Developers, uh, this is the way most of our development activities are going nowadays. <clears throat> and big data enthusiasts like me. There's a lot of resources out there on the web for you to uh, study yourself. Who should not attend? Um, really, nobody. I mean, everybody should attend this kind of chat. Uh, <clears throat> so let's go. Let's grab a bite now. So, so you know what is the size and the scale of big data that we are talking about. That 
so far I have been stuck between terabyte and petabyte, but the real big data lies way beyond exabytes. And there is one more after this, and if anybody knows what that is, that'll be awesome. It's called Brontobyte, and then multiply the lowest figure that you have, that one, two, zero, eight, nine, two, five, blah, blah, blah. Multiply that by 1,024, and you'll get a Brontobyte. I don't know what that is anymore, but uh, it's, it's a huge number. So let's get on further. So what we'll do today is we're gonna have some really miscellaneous information on big data. I already shared with you one story. I'll share, you, I'll share with you another story. And that is about a bus route in an African city which was changed with the use of big data. Uh, what are the sources of big data, for example? We'll talk about that. We'll also see if we can, um, if anybody knows what breadcrumbs are, if somebody can actually type the answer up here, that'll be awesome. Then, um, what is the definition of big data? What really is big about big data? Uh, we'll also see what are the privacy concerns as to what is okay to share, um, what is really public. Just because you have the data in your possession, does it make you the owner of the data and so on? Who has the rights? What is a data lake, for example? We'll talk about that also. This one I actually picked up from James Serra of Microsoft. Um, he and I kind of spoke together at Maryland SQL Saturday last year, and that's where I got this information from. Um, storing layer is uh, Hadoop. We'll talk about Hadoop. Uh, what are the components of Hadoop? Hadoop 1.0, Hadoop 2.0, and what are the various uh, Hadoop stacks? For example, for Yahoo or for LinkedIn, you can actually see these. And a lot of these slides that I have posted on slideshare.net slideshare have been clipped several times, actually, believe it or not. Um, what is processing in the big data? So there's a, story, a storing layer, there's a processing layer, and there's a presentation layer. So presentation layer is something that the BI folks and the developers would be immensely interested in. Uh, I would definitely say presentation and processing is something you guys want to really take into consideration there. And data science and data scientists, I will actually not have enough time for this. So I believe it or not, I've actually removed those two slides. And uh, we said we'll see some uh, Hadoop stacks and then in the end we'll have summary. I don't know if we'll have time for too many questions, but feel free to shoot me an email with any questions that I can answer outside of this um, and Pare web conference. <coughs> yes. Paresh, you've got an answer to um, breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs defined as the path that was navigated. Is this what you were asking? That's what I know of it as. Hmm. Kind of, let, let's just say I, it's like a half answer that I was looking for. But when we talk about the sources, I will definitely give this information to you as to what really breadcrumbs are, right? Okay. So, Curtis okay, and, is uh, volunteering that they're bits of information. Correct. I think that's a much better answer that I was actually looking for, that it's bits of information coming out of what, for example. So if somebody has a couple of seconds and they want to scribble the answer there, that'll be awesome. In the meantime, we can go ahead, right? Okay. So why should I care about this? I'm usually very rigid about not having too much verbiage in a slide, but this one, and there is one more towards the data lake uh, uh, slide that has got too much information in the slide, but what is big data? Why is it so important for us? Satya Nadella of Microsoft says that, you know, it is going to be the electricity for the next generation. And where is the data stored, for example, and what sort of data is stored? And as you say, in traditional databases, we have rows and columns. A couple of these things will be repeated down the line. And the big data explosion comes essentially out of images, streaming data, clicks, internet-connected devices, uh, machine data, uh, 
YouTube videos, uh, which is basically streaming data and so on. So this is from the Microsoft presentation. So let's just take a quick look at uh, what is it that is different here, okay? So the data characteristics, if you know, in traditional data uh, databases, we have relational data with uh, the models and the schemas are very highly modeled and it is right uh, or schema on right and big data is basically all data, all sorts of data and it can, you can read and create the schema as you read it. There is nothing predefined in that. The cost, as you will see, and there's one more slide about this cost part only, uh, which shows that, you know, in the traditional RDBMS, we have specialized hardware, which could be something like a um, HP server or a Dell server with like, you know, a gazillion bytes of SAN and uh, flash storage, etc. Whereas in the big data processing, it's all commodity hardware. And the culture, this is crucial for us. So in operational reporting, we'll see this also a little bit further down is that almost everything we do in our traditional RDBMS scenario is on operational reporting and we are using it basically as a rear view mirror to find out what happened. But if you look at big data, it can actually help you do something with future in mind as to which way is this data going? Can we club machine learning to go with big data and get some awesome futuristic predictions? I haven't quite figured out the stock market yet, so don't ask me for any formula for that. So decision making, right? Okay, let's look at this. So today's processing is basically rear view mirror and big data is forward looking. Data used, um, Although this one is from Schmarzo, a book uh, that I read, um, it says less than 10%, but when I speak to a lot of people in the BI industry, they say the amount of data that we use in reporting today is less than 2%, and big data you can use. Quality, batch, incomplete, and disjointed data today, whereas this is real-time correlated and governed. Purpose business monitoring, business optimization, and predictions. So this will be available for those who are interested to download and use later. So what are the sources? Let's look at that, okay? So this is one of the questions we asked, right? One of the biggest friend or enemy you have today in your hand and in your pocket is your cell phone. And you want to be extremely careful with what you leave behind through your cell phone, so the bits of data that you kind of strew around while you're moving from one cell tower to another cell tower is essentially called as breadcrumbs. And that is how the mice actually run after you and get to your big data. Uh, I'll give you a classic example of why this big data really helps in the breadcrumbs scenario, for example. I have been transferring small chunks of money, you know, $50 to my brother, there, some people over PayPal and so on. Uh, two days back, actually, literally two days back, I transferred $2,300 to a friend of mine in India who has a bank account here in America, and that money got stopped as a possible fraud because I had actually never transferred such a huge chunk of money outside the country. And uh, I got like three phone calls and six emails pertaining to that and I eventually had to sort it out personally to say that, yes, this is me who made this transfer. Please go ahead and unblock it. So the idea is that based on what analysis they had of the data, they were actually able to predict that this could possibly a fraud, be a fraud. Social media, for those who are out there on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat, everything you do uh, is geo, I mean, geographically taggable. So be careful what you're doing. If you are on a vacation, you don't want to post pictures that you are on vacation, especially when your house is not occupied. You can, you're basically inviting a lot of trouble. Credit cards. How many of you on this uh, conference uh, have actually had their credit cards being used in Germany or Russia for a $50 purchase and that was actually blocked 
mine has been done three times that you know sir your credit card just popped up in germany somewhere for a 54 dollar purchase and i see that you just bought something in massachusetts five minutes back there is no ways you could have been there at the same time so is this really you or is it a fraud and i said no that's not me so you can stop the transaction so credit cards they actually monitor and the, the saying in big data world in social analytics world is that what you want people to think about you is out there on the social media whereas what you actually do is out there in your credit cards data so be very watchful of what you do using credit card gps is right i mean when you travel i don't know if you have heard of these stories or not but the gps is that you use can actually help you get a ticket from the traffic cops here for example i was traveling on new jersey turnpike at a very high speed uh, i can't say the speed here but um, between uh, exit 14 and exit 8 it took me about 32 minutes to reach there whereas technically it should have taken me about 40 minutes uh, as it turned out uh, immediately after i got out of there um, there was a cop waiting and he said you entered exit 14 at such and such time and you exited uh, exit 8a at such and such time this the speed limit there is 65 and you are going approximately 80 miles an hour so here's your ticket my friend and this means that you were traveling at approximately this level so be very careful when you're using gps iot and variables are the other ones that actually give out a lot of information about what you do out there in public so these are where you get essentially all your breadcrumbs from so you know there's a movie gone in 60 seconds right but what's really gone in 60 seconds on the internet I won't bore you through all of these details, but if you look at it, in 60 seconds, people have watched approximately 70,000 hours of Netflix video. Google would have dished out 3.5 million search queries. Facebook has almost a million logins happening every 60 seconds. So go figure, 452,000 tweets being sent on a regular basis. Something that also shocked me totally was the Spotify image, I mean, the Spotify music part of that approximately 40,000 hours listened. Uh, the other thing I thought was more popular was Facebook, but not Snapchat. Um, and you can see that in about 60 seconds, you have 1.8 million snaps created and sent as against uh, 900 logins, uh, 900,000 logins in Facebook. So no wonder Facebook actually went ahead and acquired Snapchat because of its ability to connect and collect breadcrumbs and the sources are all given to you here so nothing that i've taken over here is my creation so i'm just sharing so so what is big data so essentially till about one year back big data basically meant it had to have volume it had to have velocity and it had to have variety if none of one of these three is absent, then it's not considered big data. So for example, you have terabytes of data, but it's not changing very regularly, then it's not big data. If it doesn't have many forms of data, then it's not big data. And then last year, sometimes they actually added this fourth one also, which is called veracity. And there is some outlying data in every single research that you do like as indicated by this blurred black spots here you want to be very watchful of that you should not totally discard those because they can actually make or break what you analyze okay so this is the fourth one but early this year somebody in mit said you know all these four are great but what is the point of having all this data if it is not adding value to what we are doing for example you may have like some serious big chunk of data that is flowing in from china every single day from variety of sources right and it has good data it has some bad data or extreme data something that is further away from normal but if it is not adding any value to your project or your purpose that is not the big data for you so just remember that. So the fifth V is the, the value, and the first four are volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. 
I'm gonna move on. Anybody have questions, Sharon? Anybody shoot any questions so far? Not yet. Okay. And I see there's about 80 people. So for my Microsoft MVP application, can I say there were 400 people? Uh, possibly. No. Okay. Ah, oh, darn. So what are the desired properties of the data that you collect? Uh, let's go through it one at a time. There are five R's in this robustness, just to be fault tolerant. And yes, they will be fault tolerant because they are spread over much cheaper hardware. It's not just one machine, but it's spread over multiple machines. And if you look at HD Insight, you will see that you have at least minimum three node cluster. So if something goes wrong with one cluster, your data is not lost. Low latency, very crucial for you. It is not coming fast enough. You're going to lose the ability to analyze. Can you scale it? That's one of the properties. And generalization, in the sense, you remember the earlier slide where I said the veracity is kind of alluding to this generalization factor in the sense that not only are you looking for some data to be hovering around the mean of the entire data set, but you could actually also be looking at the outliers. So can you actually do some sort of generalization by looking at the data alone? That's important. Extensibility, can we use this data to actually do something meaningful and see what else can we do with this existing data than just the process or the project we bought it for? Can we run ad hoc queries against that? Yes, that is something which is where Microsoft comes in. Microsoft is kind of not as late to the big data game as it was in the internet game. And I'm happy that Microsoft is now really all caught up with the big data game. It doesn't require any maintenance. And why would you want to maintain it? Just imagine because this is really not your data. So why would you waste your time trying to maintain the data for you? And debuggability, and please don't try to look this up in dictionary, it is not there. This is something that I just got across. It basically means that if there is some issue with the data, can you actually go ahead and debug it? Can you get to the bottom of it and find out how you got this data? And if that is not, then it is not ideal property of big data. You want to be able to find out what the heck went wrong. <clears throat> So let's see, anybody know what ETL is standing for? Come on, I was, just want to make sure not everybody fell asleep today. Can somebody just quickly write it up? Three, two, one, go. Sharon, anybody respond? Extra, yeah, all sorts of people have responded with a variety of, um, it's all the same thing. Extract, transform, and load. Beautiful. So, so let me break your heart a little bit by saying that this concept is the process of big data. So we'll see how big data is generally processed, and then we'll dive deeper into each of these components as the slides progress. And Sharon, I don't have a clock here, so if you can just keep me honest about the time, that'll be awesome. Okay, will do. You've got 20, 20 uh, I can't subtract. You've got less than half an hour left. Oh, geez, okay. So let's go through this. I won't rush though. So collection is the first stage. Comes pre-processing. What is pre-processing? Basically, you want to make sure that there's a lot of data that you know for sure is bad. You may actually remove it and only pass on the most meaningful data to yourself. Don't throw away the other data yet, okay? Cleanse it. Cleansing it means, you know, kind of, you know, the way we have uh, Melissa data that will give you, you know, 100% reliable data about zip codes and so on. We can, we can go ahead and tally our data against that to make sure that it is very hygienic. After that, it is analyzed to see, hmm, is this exactly what I want? 
what is the report that I can run out of this? This data is good. I'm analyzing it. And after I analyze it, I will go ahead and do a presentation or visualization of this. Now, <clears throat> here comes the classic thing. What happens after visualization? For those who have seen the movie Zero Dark Thirty, you will see that Jessica Chastain actually keeps on going to her boss's glass door and keeps on writing figures on that door 30, 40, 129 days of what? Basically a lot of inaction. So she had given everything up to the visualization point, including the place where they found Osama bin Laden. But what was missing was this part, intervention. So there was no intervention in that case. And the important part of a big data thing is that if you are collecting and doing everything up to visualization, but not acting on it, there are two things that can go wrong. You have already spent a whole bunch of money acquiring and processing and visualizing the data. But because the speed at which the data flows, remember the velocity of the data is very important for us. This data would have changed in virtually no time. So you have to go through this entire cycle all over again if you do not intervene in time. So remember I, when we started, I told you, I'll tell you about the bus route that was changed using big data. Guess how it was done? So this is about an African city and they found out that every day people were getting late to work and most of the people who were getting late to work were using the same bus route day in and day out. So they actually spoke to the uh, passengers of the bus and they followed with them and said, okay, we need to be able to track your cell phone GPS data to see what you're doing and why the bus is late and so on. So by looking at, they had, the visualization and the intervention was that they found out that when when the bus entered the downtown area that is where the real slowdown began so what people started doing was that they started getting off one mile ahead of their existing real bus stop that was the requirement and then they would go through other streets going walking towards their office and they still managed to reach faster than by using the bus alone so by tracking their phones they found out that by just switching the bus route over from the main street to the adjacent street, they were able to actually knock off about 40, 45 minutes of time for people. And that is what intervention is. Had they done this little later, we don't know if the same data would have held because people would have started using Uber or something like that and they would not have been able to get the uh, appropriate insight into the people's behavior. Okay, so, and the shocking thing is that over 90% of today's data was created literally in past two years. Okay, so five hours of data quality. Let's look at that. Relevancy. Is the data relevant for you, right? In the sense that we are talking about the fifth V, which is value. It's kind of that. So is the data relevant to your cause? Is it recent? This kind of addresses the velocity. Is it because it's very fast moving? What do we do from here? Range, does it have the veracity of the data? That's what you're looking at. Robustness, right? That's the perfect thing. Can you rely on this data? Do you believe that by doing the second set of observation or if you went back to the same place, you would still find the same data? Uh, it In most cases, it is true. Uh, I'll give you another example that in the oil spudding business, you know, where they actually do the drilling of the oil wells. They have tips, uh, sensor tips at the end of the drill bits. And each of this sends out like millions of, I think about four megabytes per second of real time sensor data back to the main computer. And by, by going down further, they found out that as soon as they were approaching closer to the oil in say 50 feet, the pressure started becoming lesser and that way they knew that they were able to strike oil much more easily in that well than any other place. And this they found by following that rule over multiple wells, 
they could actually emulate the same exact behavior, which basically signifies the robustness of it. And can you rely on this whole thing in the sense that where did you get it from? Did you buy it off eBay? Did you buy it off the website of World Bank? And by the way, if you're ever looking for a huge chunk of big data and large uh, spreadsheets of data about poverty in USA or wealth distribution in USA, World Bank is an awesome site to go to, your census data and so on. So buy it from reliable sources. Don't just buy it from Amazon where you say, yeah, this guy bought the MVA course. He also bought five terabytes of this database. No, let's talk about the privacy, okay? This is very crucial. Just by a quick one word answer, what is more sensitive towards data and its privacy, Europe or USA? Can we just have a quick show of answers? Most people are saying Europe. Yes, absolutely, that is so true. So, so much about USA being the shepherd of all the big, uh, all the data and our stewardship of so much data, we are not half as safe as Europe. Um, I attended this big data class through MIT and they spoke about how they handle the big data um, pertaining to what is called the Copenhagen experiment. Please go ahead and read it up. It's an awesome field experiment, which actually helped them place the bikes and the college schedules based on how people were congregating. And that entire data was the collection of the congregation, sorry, the data about people meeting and walking around was collected using their cell phone records. And this data was used only for that purpose and nothing else. So let's look at this. If I collect the data, is it mine? Uh, no. Sorry to break your heart, but it's not yours, okay? So yes, you own it or you don't own it, but you have rights to it right now. So go ahead and use it explicitly for the purpose for which you collected the data. Otherwise, you can get into serious trouble, okay? Uh, share the answers, not the best. So if you collected people's movement um, data, for example, you don't share the data with the other cell companies or other universities. You just tell them that this is what we found without actually divulging any information about anybody's cell phone number and their movement habits. Let them know why are you collecting the data? What are you collecting it for? And sorry, what are you collecting from the data? Remember the, uh, I don't know how many of you are here from the are from USA, but I would guess most of you are. So, you know, when they sign a warrant, they have to actually be very explicit about what you are collecting. And even if you see a dead body next to the computer where you are going to do that, technically you cannot touch the dead body because that is not a part of your warrant. So what you are collecting, why you are collecting, you have to let your customer know. Go through this, uh, this is a long slide. Again, a, too much verbiage here, so I'm not going to do this. Um, in transparency of why you're collecting individual control, people should know exactly what they And uh, you can bury a lot of this collection policies in a like, you know, 40 page uh, accept uh, agreement that says that, you know, somewhere in fine print it says, I'm actually going to use your data for creating blah, blah, blah. Uh, Again, respect the context. That is the first thing you want to behave, why you bought it and why you took the data. You want to use it only in that context. Security, don't give it to anybody, period. Uh, access and accuracy, make sure they're both taken care of. Uh, if, if you are doing anything by mistake, go ahead and claim it and move forward. Otherwise, it's going to be like uh, Equifax, where they had access, they had accuracy, but there was no securities, which is kind of violating this uh, FIPA. Uh, focus collection, do it in and out of your collection policy. Go in, collect what you need, and get the heck out of there. Don't overdo it. Uh, this is something for most Americans you will know that right now, which is quite a big chunk of change, but I cannot 
know how he's doing in college because that comes under Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. So I can see his bills, but I cannot see his scores. And this is from James Sarah. I'm going to go through this. This is all actually you really need to know for this slide, but there's a lot of verbiage that follows with it. So it's a storage repository, generally not very permanent, but yes, it holds a vast amount of data, raw data that is. And uh, when I say raw data, it could be MP3s, it could be videos, it could be images, it could be tweets, anything. And you just keep it till you need it. So. And you know, because it is in Hadoop, it is very cheap, so you don't have to really worry about it, right? Let's just go through this for now, right? So one of the things that I would like you to see is the third or the fourth bullet is that it complements your enterprise and it's, it can be complementing it very well, used with each other rather than at the expense of each other. Um, it does free up a lot of EW resources because most of it is now being stored offsite on Hadoop and cheap hardware. Okay, so when I said, you know, we talked about ETL, right, um, which is a extract, transform, and load. Uh, in the big data field or the realm of big data, that is now slightly changed because you first extract then load and then worry about transform. Because what they're saying is that because this data is changing too fast, let's go ahead and first extract whatever information we want, load it into our programs, and then we'll do the work of transforming it into whatever we want. Because we don't want to lose any data, we will do it slightly opposite to what we do in uh, relational databases. And yes, it is uh, data lakes are very easily scalable. So this is, um, the best one, this is James Serra. Please thank him for that whenever you see him. He speaks at a lot of these events. So this is pretty much what it is. And big data leg is that you can see on the left side, there is uh, tons of sources that you have your information. Uh, you basically ingest all the data, store all the data and analyze it. And analyzing it using batch queries or interactive queries, some real time analytics, uh, machine learning and some some of that is actually pumped back into data warehouse uh, on a more permanent basis, more for the metadata purpose than anything else. And as you can see in the bottom, I have made this specific observation that it turns into a data swamp if you do not invest in the data quality. Remember, we are talking about reliability. If you do not concentrate on that, uh, then this will become data swamp. And then again, you have to drain the swamp, which is not pretty. Okay, so then came, let's talk about Hadoop quickly, right? So Doug Cutting and Mike Caffarella thought about this and they said, you know, geez, why do we have to always have expensive hardware to process our big our data? At that time, there's no real big definition of big data. So they decided that, okay, what if just like um, we have VMware and we have uh, multiple instances on a VM, why can't we have something like this for big data too? So they said, okay, let's have Hadoop, and they called it Hadoop because of the, and his son's toy was an elephant. So everything pertaining to Hadoop, most of the query languages, the processing software, everything has some form of Hadoop there, I mean the elephant in it. So what are the benefits of Hadoop? Let's look at it. So Hadoop is basically low cost because it's based on commodity hardware, right? Uh, this means that it is scalable, right? Um, it's fairly modular too, right? In the sense, and it can be local, it can be in the cloud. And more importantly is, this is what I actually aspire my body to be, is to be flexible. And uh, that is what Hadoop actually provides you, which is not always the case with the on-prem servers. For example, it took me, I was actually working on the big data course um, using the big data analytics using HD Insight. It took me about, 10 minutes to come up with a five node cluster. So it's a very simple cluster, but I was so happy I could actually do it uh, just a few mouse clicks using the Azure portal. So the way Hadoop is basically works is that there is a master slave, okay, which kind of talks to a name node, on a name node, sorry, and then it has a job tracker. 
so the job tracker actually gives out jobs for processing so say for example you wanted to see the whole book that I have with me has like 20 million words or whatever it is and you want to find out how many of these words begin with an A, B, C, D, E and so on the job will create possibly 26 jobs give it out to 26 slave nodes each of these nodes in, ta in its turn has a task tracker which will go ahead and run on the data node itself do whatever you want to do by mapping it and then reducing it reducing is basically just aggregation and mapping is basically sending it across for aggregation and it will collect all the data for you and bring it back to the master node so that is basically the master slave architecture for your Hadoop okay there's some more examples further down so so what is map reduce let's look at this so map reduce is basically on a client node it you have an application that you say okay I want to do ABC things there it uses the job client uh, submits a job to a job tracker on a master node right um, it will also locate geez where is the data that I'm actually processing oh it's on nodes name nodes a b c d e f g whatever it is now it will go ahead and run these as a map job and a reduced job on those uh, data nodes through the tasks that is uh, the sub component of a job recollect all the information aggregate and share it back to you in any of the variety of ways so map sends the queries for getting the results reduce actually collects the results or aggregates it job tracker is basically nothing as I said it basically defines what the task is and it finds where the data is so it will send a, a request to an appropriate data node or a name node and yarn is yet another resource negotiator and how this is now becoming the big change that we are looking for is something that I'll share with you now so what has happened is that Hadoop 1.0 is now going out of vogue and it's Hadoop 2.0 is taking over the reason being that this yarn has come is, uh, in the middle between the MapReduce and the HDFS so what is the purpose of yarn it is just a resource negotiator and it actually has a much faster way to access your data and process it too that is the basic and you can actually just take the slide the way it is and you can uh, look it up also further down so in Microsoft's uh, HD Insight or the Microsoft version of Big Data, what it's saying is that there could be data sources, could be on-prem or any of these other sources like your sensor readings, your device health, your operation logs, like even Splunk data. If you have like a thousand server data center, the Splunk data from it can soon become like Big Data. So then you want to ingest it and to ingest it, you can use the Azure services using Event Hub, right? Azure Data Lake for storage, prepare the data, okay, analyze it and publish it. This is exactly the same data flow that we saw about four or five slides earlier. And to display it, you can use Power BI dashboard. And a uh, lot of other things like uh, Jupyter notebooks are also there. You can write uh, quick functions in Jupyter to go get your data and present them in the ways you have possibly not imagined. Uh, Jupyter notebooks for those who have not worked on them there's really awesome uh, one of the functions that I can talk to you about is called funf f u n f that is an MIT function that actually dives deep into data pertaining to your social physics like Facebook data or your cell phone data how it is used and then it will give you meaningful insight into what you do with that data so look at this uh, data warehouse and as you can see and big data if you see if you just kind of go up and down the slide and right uh, from left to right this is exactly the best thing this is what uh, the data warehousing and the big data kind of club into each other is Microsoft Azure has SQL data warehouse and VMs in it um, if you go looking for the big data aspects of it there are HD inside and there is data lake which is for big data for the relational databases on-prem you have APSs you have uh, SQL Server and for the big data on-prem you have 
Hortonworks, you know, local Hadoop uh, implementations and so on. So depending on how you do it, you can actually have your entire data eco ecology to have all of these or depending on where you want to be. If you want to be in cloud, then you possibly want to just do the upper two. If you want to be on-prem, then you want to do the lower two and so on. So presentation layer, right? So you can use R, as you know, now 2016 has an built inbuilt R engine for you. You can use that for presentation. Now you can use Python. I have used Python with my during my MIT class, and it was absolutely amazing. Literally, like one line of code got me the reports that I could never imagine doing with SQL Server. It was absolutely mind blowing. So Python, extremely powerful, painful but powerful. Uh, Power BI, then Power BI Desktop, you definitely want to use that. So if you look at LinkedIn's, uh, because now we looked at the various components, now let's see how these are actually adopted by various uh, um, infrastructures like that of LinkedIn. For example, as you can see, the data sources for LinkedIn can be anywhere of this side. The data is ingested using any of the software like Automatic, um, Informatica, ETL, uh, Lumos, Camus, and Goblin. And the data store could be, you know, Teradata or any of these three, right? And then when you're reporting, you can use Hive, which is basically a SQL that is used on big data. And then uh, Pig, Ad Hoc, and MicroStrategy data, or even use Tableau reporting software but Tableau is very expensive, so <clears throat> try SSRS. For those who know, Hadoop has, um, the Hortonworks people have a serious uh, competition in way of, uh, by way of Cloudera. This is Cloudera's uh, big data or the Hadoop stack. Uh, remember, they're all basically hand in glove. Everything depends on distributed file system of Hadoop, right? So just take a quick look at this uh, share on time. So we have like three more minutes, geez. Okay, so let's go ahead and summarize. So we see what some miscellaneous information. We saw a couple of stories. We saw what are the stories, what are the breadcrumbs. Uh, we defined what big data is, uh, what are the major issues that go with the privacy of big data, what is the data lake, uh, we saw what is Hadoop, uh, what is uh, the map reduce part of uh, the processing of big data, and how do you present big data. Uh, I did not cover data science and scientists, sorry about that, but we saw a few Hadoop stacks also. So let's conclude and see how we take it into the future. Check this with your manager and see, or your organization, what is your futuristic strategy? Uh, what is your data strategy? What is your cloud strategy? Uh, are you able to use adjacent technologies which will make you powerful? Now this is for the DBAs. Can you use Power BI? Can you use Hadoop or some flavor of it? Can you use NoSQL, for example? Uh, definitely look into it because pure DBA jobs are vanishing. So someday, remember, big data will just be data. Thank you. Thank and you. this is just my information for you again. Uh, yeah, one sec. Uh, and this is the bibliography. If you want, this will be uploaded the exact way it is right now for you. And that should be pretty much it. So okay. we are well in time. We've cool. got a couple of questions. And if you'll send me your slides, I can post them with the recording. Sure. Absolutely. I'll take care of it. OK. Um, can you provide any techniques for finding complementary data set data from other data sets to integrate with your own data set? So one of the things I suggested was, you remember the classic example that I actually used was from the World's, World Bank's website. We could just freely download it and we use that for analysis of how people are using their cell phones and uh, the distribution of cell phone amongst rich, amongst the poor, and so on. Uh, I would definitely go about looking into it. And uh, these massive organizations like United Nations, World Bank, uh, have these complementary and 
but they are pretty big okay so you may really want to be careful when you start downloading them and make sure that your network admin knows that you're going to download this otherwise it's not going to be pretty I hope that answers the question for you so yes there are a lot of them available uh, have I used all of them no not at all in fact the couple of things that I've used is the one that was provided to us by MIT um, there's one which we downloaded as I said from World Bank and one of the attendees would like to know what MIT class you attended these he says a lot are online and he'd like to try to look it up so yes I can actually answer that also it is called big data analytics in social physics so it basically shows you how to use your cell phone data for the better good I mean for the good of uh, all the people concerned in that so uh, I will send you the link to that one actually so MIT has designed it but uh, the company that actually runs it is called get smarter uh, it's a South African company so I hope that answers your question. I will send that link also with uh, my response to Sharon. Thanks. Where do I start to implement a big data solution on-prem? Any suggestions? Marketing. Talk to your marketing people. Definitely. They are the ones who can most likely, I don't know what your organization is, but uh, if your organization is a fairly large organization and if they're not already using big data, this is a good time for them to start downloading this data and start monkeying around with it along with um, some machine learning that goes with it because a lot of these machine learning uh, stacks that you have up there you don't even need to download the data you can just keep that in Azure or any other cloud-based services and just run your algorithm straight against that data and I mean just right off the cuff you'll get several reports just coming out without any absolutely any hassles and it's a good way to look pretty in front of your boss. I think I did not see MongoDB in your slides. Any reason to exclude it? No, that is something that I must do. And I promise I will do it in the next presentation, which is coming up on December 6th for the Wisconsin uh, DBA user group. Thank you for pointing it out. If you can, somebody can actually saw my email address. If you can just email me that suggestion. I actually even have MongoDB on my uh, home laptop and I uh, use it there too. Prashant, I, Paresh, I'm going to send you all the questions. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So Thank you'll you. have it. And, and the other question is related. What do you think of the future of MongoDB? I don't know really. I'm sorry. I. I wish I knew the answer for that. I don't know what I'm going to be doing at five o'clock today, so I don't know much about MongoDB, to be very honest. And somebody says, I am so scared to hear that DBA jobs are vanishing. Yes, I'm sorry, but that is the, I mean, the pure DBA job as we know it are vanishing. They are merging with development jobs. They are merging with cloud-based technology jobs they are merging with big data because if you look at seriously if you look at the DBA advertisement today they will want you to know at least five basic technologies which is kind of really unnerving for me at least and the other worst part is that they also want you to bring home the troops from Afghanistan they should you should know how to fly a f-16 <laughs> so these are some no seriously I mean this is how ridiculous people are getting because the DBAs actually go out of their way to do bend their back and do a lot more for their employers than ever before so this is now becoming like a norm really go ahead and look up a DBA position opening I was uh, laid off on 7th July I did not have a job for four weeks of course it was summer vacation not many people were hiring then but even the ones that I have now they want me to know MongoDB seriously uh, and I have never actually been an on or uh, big data engineer myself but in this three or four weeks I have actually picked up a lot of uh, bits and pieces of other technologies so if that answers your question my friend and for about four or five years ago I remember in the Boston BI group we had a Microsoft engineer who had come and he actually made this very statement that the what we think the traditional DBA roles are are vanishing 
so it's up to us to kind of you know uh, step up our boots and start learning newer technologies faster than ever before and there are a couple of requests for big data boot camp training courses i think you had some of those in the resources in your slide yes so uh, microsoft virtual academy absolutely fabulous place to look into i'm not kidding i know this is a pass which means essentially we are dedicated to microsoft despite all the jokes i make about microsoft definitely that's a course or the series of courses you want to take coursera and um, which was the other one how come i forget that so they have a lot of this uh, machine learning courses uh, python uh, data scientist job which i did not talk for paucity of time uh, definitely look at it the data scientist jobs are almost guaranteed to go up by about 40 to 50 percent over the next year or so so there are a lot of in fact one of our uh, sponsors for the Boston BI group is um, actually having a master's course in data science which has been evolved by talking to employers so if you need information about that feel free and again I know I'm trying to keep the commercial um, spin about this as low as possible but feel free to reach out to me through email or tweet about my presentation I would really 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 appreciate that guys and girls is your Twitter handle in your slide deck yes ma'am and I can also type it here if you want to go no, ahead and just uh, we'll post the slides on the uh, dba.pass.org site and you can get the Twitter account and everything there yep I'd like to thank Paresh for the um, The word you're looking for is awesome. For the yeah, but that's awesome. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's what I was looking for. for. The awesome presentation. And I also um, want to tell everybody that Paresh will come back to us uh, on the first, second, on, uh, let's see, October 11th. And he's going to talk about fine-tuning your maintenance plans, which will be quite different. Very different, yeah. And so I thank Paresh for being with us. And I will he will send me the slide deck. I will post it on the pass.dba, and it should be there by sometime tomorrow. <clears throat> and... I thank you all for coming. Uh, we have another meeting on the 27th where we're having a t presentation about continuous deployments using the C C SQL Server data tools, which is quite different from the, what we normally have, and I think you'll find it interesting. So thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you again. Thank you again. Everybody, bye. Have a lovely day. See ya. Thank you.